why don't we go ahead and get started because it will be a few minutes before uh, Dr. Lau presents because we've got a few uh, introductions and announcements. So we'll take care of those first. And then if someone does uh, miss out, many of them are repeats from other presentations, other meetings. So they can catch up on most of the things I'm going to say. So first, welcome to our fourth meeting in our series of 21 in 21 uh, meetings, virtual meetings for the fabric community. This meeting is on uh, COVID and vaccinations. And thank you for doc to Dr. Lau for uh, presenting to us tonight. And um, we'll get her on in a minute. And thank you to Dawn for being here, my co-host as usual. And um, once I talk about Dawn a little bit, then Dawn is going to formally uh, introduce Dr. Lau, and then we'll get started with the presentation. So if you've been to these meetings before, you, uh, my script hasn't changed much in the beginning. So Dawn is, of course, most of you know from uh, Emory University, and uh, she is our multi-talented, multi multi-faceted uh, genetic counselor extraordinaire with uh, many other functions. She is a um, assistant professor, a clinical researcher, um, manages the, let me make sure I say it right. So uh, manages, she's the program leader for the LSD Center at Emory and the director of genetic clinical trials um, at, at the Department of Human Genetics at Emory. In addition to writing or contributing lots of uh, research papers and writing children's books and being an all around, uh, she's there when we need us kind of person. So thank you again for uh, Dawn being with us. You know, we couldn't do it without her. And then um, I have a few slides that I'm going to um, talk about and then Dawn will introduce Dr. Lau. So let me share my screen. See if I can do this a little bit more eloquently than I've done in the past. Okay. So first, you probably know this because you, well, for lots of reasons, but I, you've probably seen me blasting you with messages about Fabry Disease Awareness Month this month. So, you know, we just, uh, every year we take the month of April, we increase our awareness to try to keep letting people know more about Faber disease, about um, educate people um, with Faber disease and families and physicians and, and healthcare providers and caregivers and the wider community to better understand um, and recognize and diagnose first to better understand, to better manage, to better treat um, people with fiber disease. So that's one of our sort of our broad mission. So in April every year, we usually do a governor's proclamation program. And that's really been postponed because of uh, poor response from the states while they're still wrestling with the pandemic and the elections and, and various things. So we decided to not, um, not create more work for them while they're still under this these circumstances and postpone our program until uh, next year. It's still Fabric Disease Awareness Month. We just don't have the formal proclamations we usually get from many governors around the country. So we'll work on that. And of course, if you've seen uh, the newsletter or Facebook or our tweets, we're doing a daily um, post of, on each one of those to spread awareness. The next thing is we like to highlight some of the programs that industry is involved in. So I've just made a list. I, I won't read the whole list. When you get the recording for this presentation, you can pull this slide up and look at more of the details if you'd like. But each uh, company that's out there working on either, either has a treatment for Faber disease or is working on a treatment has a um, uh, something in here, a highlight about the resources they're providing to the community to help uh, to let you know what's going on. 
and to help educate people with Parkinson's disease. So you can see the websites for Santa Fe Genzyme. Um, Amicus has the same. They have a, a patient website and they have a um, April 11th, they have a meeting coming up and it's uh, women in February. Casey has their new Rethink Fabre website. It's pretty interesting. So check that out. And we hope this hasn't changed, but we think we'll, the Casey solution, PRX 102, as it's known um, in, in clinical trials, is up for review for a decision date on approval in the United States. So um, AvroBio and Sangamo and 40MT are all in the process of clinical trials for Fabry disease. And Adorsia, those are all gene therapies. And Adorsia has closed their clinical trial, but they're still under review for, to get approved by the FDA for their substrate reduction therapy. So um, I think, I don't think there's one of those, anything else, no. So you can pull this slide back up when the recording's out and look at more details. But I just want to show you that. Let me switch. Uh, it's not going to let me change slides. I'm going to have to exit and re enter this. Brenda, this may be the part where you said my computer is acting up, or the internet, rather. Okay. So the next slide is we put this feature on our website at www.fabrydisease.org. And if you go in the top menu bar all the way over to company and clinic information, you can select uh, pharma info, clinic info, and support organization info. And what you'll see is what's below that main, uh, main image. And you'll see where you can go select each of the companies or each of the support organizations and, and go down to the read more button on the bottom and find out what resources are available from each of those organizations to kind of help you find things when you need it. So that's there for your reading pleasure. And the last thing is um, we still have a lot of calendars to distribute. So if you don't have a 2021 Fabry disease educational calendar, uh, contact us and we'll make sure you get one. We've, we're starting, or we haven't, since we started these meetings, we're sending a calendar out to everyone who registers. So it's all we'll need to do is verify your address before we send it out um, so we don't waste money. And uh, so you should uh, get one of those. If, you use, if you're using the same address you registered with, then we'll have it and we'll just um, verify with it before we send it. So uh, I guess I do have one more thing. So as you know, you all registered on this website. So each time we finish a meeting, you'll see the next meeting registration link open. So thank you for participating and I am finished and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand you off to the very capable Don Laney. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so you guys, I am so glad to be here with you on in uh, April, February Awareness Month. Um, and I know we're all aware of February every day, but this is for everybody else to be as aware of as we are. Um, and I'm also very grateful to be able to introduce today Dr. Heather Lau. Um, Dr. Lau is an assistant professor at, uh, of neurology at NYU in the School of Medicine. And she's assistant director of neurogenetics at NYU. And then she also, just to top it all off, is the director of the Lysosomal Storage Disease uh, Center over there as well. So she has been a friend to Fabre and our sister and brother diseases for a long time now. Uh, you may have heard her excellent talks that focus on uh, neuropathic pain and also the impact of stroke and Fabre disease. But we're switching gears a little bit because she was in the hot spot uh, at in New York during the initial COVID epidemic and the first spike that hit New York much harder than anywhere else in that first beginning part. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lau and she can uh, start sharing her slides and we will see what we exciting things we're going to learn tonight. Thank you, John. You're welcome. I was just going to mention also put your questions in the comments and I'll gather them together as Dr. Lau is speaking and that way we can kind of give her a a nice summary and she can answer those as she goes through. 
All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to just connect with everyone. And so as Dawn said, um, I'll be speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, starting off with a little bit about what we've learned about COVID-19 over time, something called long hauler syndrome. And then we'll go into about vaccine development. And I wanna leave plenty of time for a discussion as well. So let's go forward here. So there's the um, overview right now, impact in the US, long hauler syndrome, and then an update on the vaccines. So impact. So as Don mentioned, um, as we watched our uh, colleagues across the world get hit last year, um, starting in December, January, uh, we were starting to prepare in New York for our um, hit and we did not expect it to be as bad as it got actually. And so as my colleagues and I prepared um, for the onslaught um, into our emergency rooms, we realized it was much, uh, much graver actually than we expected because what happened was that the um, virus just spread very rapidly and undetected in uh, large populations and our most vulnerable were the ones that were affected and they started to come to the ERs and we had an overrun on the ERs, we had bed situations and ICU capacity was reached, ventilator capacity. During this time, we learned a lot about the disease, um, not just about the severe form, but even the mild forms and how it was spread. So as of today, we have seen over 30 million cases in the US. We have 62,000 new cases just over the last week, um, over the last day, excuse me. The seven day case rate, this is just pulled from uh, today's website at the CDC is 133 per 100,000. And we have now reached over 500,000 deaths. And you can kind of see below how, the, um, how they are distributed. It has now hit every single state in the United States. And unfortunately, just as we hit our peak last March, our colleagues in um, various places in Texas and California had seen another, had seen a spike and a, um, basically their hospital systems were put under stress. So we see here um, the daily trends starting from last January 22nd through March 31st. And so we see this waveform just rising. And you can see, we thought we were, we had it, um, but then, really and truly in the last fall to winter, we see another spike. So these, we continue to see increased numbers of cases. And here's the death toll. So this um, initial death toll here, this peak here we saw, we were up to thousand a day in New York City dying. And now we see another peak because it's now spread across. Okay. So what do we know about SARS-CoV-2? Okay. So we learned from our colleagues in China and in Italy, that we were looking for respiratory illness at first, fever, cough, um, fatigue. Uh, at first, we didn't think there was much of a productive cough. We were trying to parse out how it differed from the average common cold or even the flu. But as we started more and more cases, we realized it was more widespread than just um, a fever and dry cough. We saw myalgias, joint pains, muscle pains. Sore throat became prominent, headache, chills. And then we actually saw some GI symptoms develop, including um, nausea or vomiting. So it seemed like a GI illness at times, congestion, nasal congestion, and diarrhea. But what we learned was that there were multi-systemic uh, presentations of this. So in the neurologic realm in my area, you could have a loss of smell or taste preceding any symptoms. We even saw um, some of the hospitalized patients develop something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a post-viral uh, ascending paralysis. Um, this is not novel to this virus. We've seen this with other viruses, but I don't think it's on the radar of our general population. And the problem here is that we saw so many people getting affected at once, we started to see these cases arise. We heard of encephalitis, which is infection in the brain. And there was a neuropathy that developed, a painful burning neuropathy in our patients who were hospitalized. And there was a higher rate of stroke. There seemed to be a hypercoagulable state or a thickening of the blood that led to an increased risk of stroke. So even if you survive the respiratory phase of the illness, patients were found later to have had a, a major stroke. 
we found some, uh, so the hematologic findings, coagulopathies, um, leading to that hypercoagulable state, leading to cardiovascular issues such as um, myocardial infarction. We saw inflammation of the heart. I'll go into a little bit more of that in the long hauler syndrome. Um, so patients who didn't really have a respiratory presentation had sudden cardiac death or sudden um, myocardial infarction without the fever and the cough. And then for patients who were hospitalized, we went on to see kidney failure. So we heard about the ventilators being in short supply, but the dialysis machines were in short supply actually in New York, and that was uh, a limiting factor. And then in children, um, again, this is not novel to this virus, but because we saw so many people affected, we saw an increased rate in this inflammatory syndrome. And this multisystemic inflammatory syndrome could present up to weeks after a, uh, a mild infection in the kids. And so that led to a multisystemic organ failure. And I think because I was surrounded by so many cases, I personally have seen um, the, uh, the MIS see in children. I've seen the stroke. I've seen all of these complications because we saw um, such a severe, um, uh, such a high rate of the severe disease. But when you talked to, to others, we, we saw that there was a lot more mild. So, you know, I'm biased because I saw the severe disease. And so here are some pictures of the skin manifestations. We saw hives. We saw um, what we called COVID toes, red toes. And actually sometimes without any symptoms in children, we could see pink, uh, pink toes and fingers and various rashes. So it really hit all of the systems. It was a multi-systemic disease that presented in different ways. So when we look at the impact in the general population, we really saw a variety of disease. Uh, we saw a variety of symptoms and severity. Again, most people were fine, right? Most people had mild to moderate disease. It was um, trying to figure out who would go on to have the more severe complications. So let's take a look at some of the data that came through. So fatigue, headache, and muscle aches were very commonly reported in those people who are not hospitalized. We also saw a sore throat and nasal congestion or runny nose, also very prominent in non-hospitalized patients. Interestingly, non-respiratory symptoms of COVID uh, could appear way before the fever and the lower respiratory symptoms. So we heard about reports of that loss of smell and loss of taste a few days or a week before they developed the fever and the characteristic respiratory findings. We saw nausea, vomiting, diarrhea also preceding that. Um, and we also saw, um, especially in our young and middle-aged patients who did not um, uh, require hospitalization. Um, oh, hold on. So I'm giving a lecture and I apologize. My little one is going to say goodnight to me. Say goodnight. All right. All right. I'm giving a lecture right now, so let's go. <laughs> okay. That is my littlest one. <laughs> and we broke a glass. Okay. All right. So this is this is home home uh, home based lectures. Okay. Don't step. Okay. So moving on, we also saw co-infection. So patients could be infected with more than one disease state, including flu, at the same time as having the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then a secondary complication was bacterial pneumonia. Um, I thought you were bacterial... on you. No, I'm giving a lecture right now. <laughs> Good night. Okay, so what were the risk factors for those of our patients who developed a severe illness? The age was the strongest risk factor that went on to have severe illness and, and went on to have a higher mortality rate. So by age group, we saw that age is greater than 85 years, um, ranging from 10 uh, to 27% uh, case fatality rate. Those above 65 to 84 had a case fatality rate of three to 11%, and those up between 55 and 64 had a one to 3%. So it dramatically reduces when you get to the younger age groups. And so we did see that you know, our elderly, those within nursing homes and other places, had a higher case fatality rate. However, we did see in my hospital and across the hospitals around the New York City area, um, those who are younger than 55 um, also succumbing to the illness. And that's because they had comorbidities. So for instance, up here we have 
the history of diabetes. Uh, so comorbidities like heart failure, coronary artery disease, congenital heart disease, cardiomyopathy, right? So we're talking febrae here and pulmonary hypertension um, could put people at a higher risk for severe complications. Those with hypertension, there was a question mark. Typically uncontrolled hypertension did put you in a higher category and those with chronic lung disease and history of stroke. So if you look at the um, proportion of US cases, about 20% of those who were affected with COVID-19 were hospitalized in the US. Of those that were hospitalized, an additional, you know, the, of those 20%, 6% were admitted to the ICU, thereby meaning that they were um, decompensating. And those admitted to the high, high ICU, depending on where you were in the United States, a fatality rate of anywhere from 26 to 32 percent and at times even higher. So mortality, mortality rate in the ICU ranged, depending on where you were, anywhere from 40 to up to 70 percent. And so once you had severe disease, it was very hard to stop the progression. Okay. So you know, I'm not going to focus on the, the management of an inpatient or hospitalized patients um, because most of us here are listening and we've been living in this pandemic and trying to avoid this, but most of us would get mild to moderate disease if we had been um, exposed, depending on your comorbidities. So if you had significant uh, cardiovascular from your Febre or your renal uh, renal disease, it could be. But some of my patients with February disease had milder disease, right? So they don't have a significant disease burden. They're on their enzyme, they're doing well. And they were asking me, well, doctor, you know, I don't have significant cardiomyopathy. I don't have significant uh, renal disease. Um, you know, it, am I still at risk? And I said, well, we don't know until you get it. And I did have a patient uh, two patients with February disease who um, ended up having COVID, a young woman with a cardiac variant who went on to have um, persistent uh, symptoms for up to three to four weeks after. So this is what we're calling the post-COVID or long hauler syndrome. Another patient of mine uh, was able to resolve within a week or two, just had some uh, headache and fever. Uh, she was classical February, but started out early on enzyme in her childhood. So she was caught early. She didn't have significant disease. But I want to focus on this post COVID 19 syndrome or long hauler because people, now that we're a year into this, we're seeing patients who've just not recovered from their initial infection. So, what is long haulers? Um, it's defined as uh, illness that's symptoms that linger um, beyond that two to three weeks and could maybe resolve by four weeks or may persist for months. And to date, the most common signs and symptoms of uh, the long hauler syndrome include fatigue, shortness of breath, despite resolution of the pneumonia, a persistent cough, joint pain, chest pain, um, muscle pain or headache, and a fast pounding heart, uh, heartbeat. So we've actually seen even young patients who had a mild disease course have and elevation in their resting heart rate. They have maybe persistent or irreversible loss of smell or taste. Um, some patients are taking months for that to return. If it returns, it, it sometimes returns and has an altered sense of smell or taste. There's certain foods just don't taste the same. And there are this, um, this there's feb, uh, there is a fog. There is a foggy syndrome that even physicians who are affected with COVID are describing problems with memory, concentration and sleep, and others have persistent rash or hair loss. So we're actually tracking this. Many hospitals are tracking their, their long hauler syndrome patients. Um, here's an interesting survey by the CDC. This is after a mild illness. And again, this is the general population. 292 adults who had tested and confirmed SARS-CoV-2 35% uh, reported not having returned to baseline after two or more weeks. So they were still having symptoms after two weeks and including 26 that were in the younger range, right? So 18 to 34, 32% of those with their age 35 to 49 had persistent symptoms. And obviously almost half of anyone over the age of 50 had persistent symptoms. So when we look at the, these patients even further, one in five of these patients in that, that, that uh, younger age range 
did not have any chronic comorbid medical conditions. So they were healthy patients who had mild COVID-19 and they did not go back to their baseline at a median of 16 days after. Now we're following them even further and people are recovering, but I'm sure you've heard in, in the um, media about the persistent symptoms that some of our patients are suffering from. So what are the long-term effects we're seeing? We're seeing on the heart, which is very relevant to our patients with Febre, especially our patients who have baseline cardiac issues. We're seeing, um, we are seeing myocardial injury. So they elevated their troponins. Remember those are the lab, uh, the, those lab, the serum samples that have been, um, uh, that you typically go through when you're having a, a heart attack. The troponin levels are elevated to show that there is heart damage. And so we do see this in the severe acute uh, COVID-19 patients, but we are now seeing persistent myocardial inflammation and inflammation of the uh, so myocarditis, as well as arrhythmias develop in those patients um, with the COVID-19, even in the milder ones. So in a German study of 100 patients, they looked at um, that recovered. So they recovered from their respiratory illness. On cardiac MRI performed over, like so 70 days after the diagnosis, still had 78% of cardiac involvement and 60% had ongoing inflammation. Okay, so we're talking about older adults. What about young people who are healthy? Among 26 competitive college athletes who had COVID-19, none of them were hospitalized. They recovered uh, reportedly without any issue. Um, the majority, right, so without any reported symptoms underwent imaging and 46% had shown some evidence of inflammation of their heart on cardiac MRI that was done anywhere from 12 to 53 days later. So, you know, so I don't want to be an alarmist, but um, we are seeing some persistent inflammation of the heart after COVID-19. It could manifest, you know, symptomatically as this persistent elevated heart rate and so actually a lot of colleges are requiring their college athletes to undergo a cardiac evaluation after they've had COVID-19 and a clearance to go back to the sports. That's how prevalent this is, okay? So long-term pulmonary effects, obviously those patients who had significant lung disease um, and they were hospitalized, 64% had persistent symptoms after uh, three months after discharge. 71% had a permanent, um, uh, had significant persistent symptoms, had radiologic abnormalities showing fibrosis. Again, these are hospitalized patients having persistent pulmonary effects um, and showing a decreased diffusion, you know, their function is, is impaired. Another study showed abnormalities in pulmonary function tests one month after discharge in uh, another series of patients. So those, that makes sense. Although, even in patients who didn't have significant pulmonary findings, they might report shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, um, even if you were not hospitalized for months after. For my area, neurologic effects, we talked about the uh, long-term anosmia and atusia, that loss of taste and smell, but we are having, and we're following exacerbations of migraines or new onset headache syndromes, vertigo, and that's really important because guess what? In Febre disease, which I've given this talk before about neurologic manifestations of Febre disease, we have issues with vertigo, episodic, uh, benign, typically vertigo. And so we are seeing some of that here. Um, stroke is uh, obviously in that immediate uh, post, um, in that immediate COVID uh, uh, period of time, you have an increased risk of stroke. We saw, um, but now, now they're describing this brain fog and mood swings. So uh, up to two to three months in otherwise pre-morbidly, pre-COVID normal people. We have reports of physicians who are on the front lines having brain fog and attention issues. Again, that could just be exacerbated in patients who already have a febre fog, right? And a chronic fatigue-like syndrome is emerging as well. Okay, so I have a... So that was the first part about a little bit of, of an update on COVID-19 and hopefully raising awareness about this long hauler syndrome. So what do we know about the vaccines? And this is not meant to 
cover every single vaccine that's under development. We're just gonna highlight the three that we know about, and then I wanna open it up for discussion. So I'll try to give you a little bit of an explanation about what these vaccines are, a little bit about the safety, efficacy, and how they were tested, and then leave it to you guys to ask questions because I could you know, field any questions that you have to the best of my ability. All right, so um, uh, just updated the slides today. So we've had a record of 3.38 million doses in one day administered in the US. That was recently um, occurred. And as of April 1st, we have nearly 154 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine that's been administered with over 56 million people having been fully vaccinated. Okay, so what I want to highlight here is if you haven't had your vaccine yet, you have millions of people who've gone through it and we are actively collecting this data on safety and efficacy, okay? So we now have three historic safe and effective vaccines being administered across the country very rapidly and we're having more in the works. Um, so we're looking at um, long-term follow-up showing that there's a high effective rate, um, effectiveness, efficacy, and a, um, we are understanding the safety of this. Overall, once you're fully vaccinated, a person's risk of infection is reduced by up to 90%. Okay, that's the, the, the big news. This is, I, you know, describing this to family and friends, um, what we achieved in this past year as a scientific community was a great feat. Um, this is amazing that we were able to bring this from the lab into humans into emergency use authorization. But by saying that, that actually can make you a little nervous, right? Because we're kind of scared of new medications. So just, this, just breaking it down a little bit by type Pfizer, we have 86 million, Moderna 77 million. The J&J &J that just came through is 4 million. Of course, that just got a little, was a little delayed in the approval, not delayed, but just behind the other two. Okay, so this is by type. Um, number of people have vaccinated, 31 million with Pfizer, 27 with Moderna and 4 million with J&J. &J. Okay, so what is emergency use authorization? So it's obviously not FDA approval and being it, speaking to a February community where we are actively trying to investigate new therapies to treat your, your genetic disease. And we have a FDA approved enzyme therapy for Fabrizyme and we have decades of experience with it now. We understand how it works. We understand the long-term safety. We understand the short-term we understand it. And so you have comfort, right? When you go for your enzyme therapies. Now um, I've given talks about the de development of therapies for um, Febre in other mechanisms, right? So SRT, substrate reduction inhibitor, we're talking about um, gene therapy, very scary sounding, but we're trying to push that forward, ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy. And so the similar here is um, we are, <laughs> actively testing vaccines, um, but an EUA is different from an FDA approval. So emergency use occurs when there's a uh, major public health emergency, such as the pandemic. Um, but it doesn't mean that we are not looking at safety and efficacy. So it, the FDA is allowing us to use this unofficially approved, right? So it's not approved use of this to treat a serious or life-threatening disease. Um, uh, when certain criteria have been met, including that there are no adequate approved or other available alternatives. So we can't have, if there was already a known vaccine for COVID-19, then we should be using that one. We can't allow all these others on, on the market, but there's nothing been approved. So, um, so once they submitted their safety and efficacy data, um, the FDA reviewed it and decided to give it emergency use authorization, okay? We can come back to that if you have specific questions. But the big question is, okay, you're saying this happened really fast. Um, how did we do this? And is it really tested? Well, you just saw how many millions of people got the vaccine. When I run rare disease trials, we have so small numbers, such small number, numbers, and we're trying to show safety and efficacy in just a handful of people in phase one, and then maybe some dozens in phase two, and maybe a hundred in our rare disease. Well, the difference here is 
we are testing this on the entire population. So the phase one that was done was already 100 volunteers done. Quickly, those brave souls went in and had the uh, vaccine administered and they looked for immediate safety, um, safety issues, and then looking for efficacy. When that was no unsafe, when it wasn't deemed unsafe, when it seemed pretty safe, they're still not sure about efficacy yet because they needed more time, uh, they went into phase two, several hundred volunteers. Again, looking at short-term side effects first and then efficacy. And that was done. Then we, they went on to roll, enroll for phase three, which is thousands and thousands of volunteers. Um, so they did go through each phase, phase one, two, three. We haven't gone to phase four yet. All right, so we did all of that, but how did we do it so quickly? Well, we did this, and I saw this personally because I run, re I run research trials at a major um, institution. The entire institution stopped what they were doing and put all their personnel onto vaccine trials. I know what it's like to try and get a trial up and running. You have to have ethics board approval. You have to have budget and money and manpower. So not just the material that you're testing, right? So that material was developed. MRI, mRNA technology has been in development for decades. Uh, we just never had a lucrative, sadly to say, um, entity to, to, to explore, right? So they used it for Zika, for Ebola, um, even for HIV, I believe. So they understood what they were doing. They just needed the platform to execute it. Same thing with gene therapy, right? So then they used existing clinical trial networks, massive multi-center trials, entire hospitals turning over their efforts and just opening up the doors. Bureaucracy moved out of the way. Uh, I've had ethics board approval for a study, but the holdup was actually the, the, the money part of it. it. Could take six months. Here, everything opened up. Manufacturing. So before you want to put all that effort into making lots of vaccine, you want to know that it's working. So a small company will not just start to develop. They'll just develop a little bit of product. Here, they just started it right away. They took the risk. They said, we have some good data and we'll start up, upping the manufacturing. This is a lot of detail, but this is what happens when you have everyone working together and they took the risk of starting to manufacture because that could take months. I know because in gene therapy, holdups for months to years occur at that stage where you're going from just a few vials up to hundreds of thousands of vials of, of, of product of clinical grade or human grade material. And so, and then finally the mRNA part of it can be produced faster than traditional vaccines, okay? And then they still had to review everything. Okay, so we have the Pfizer and the Moderna here specifically, I'll talk about the J&J. They're the mRNA ones. Uh, effectiveness, 95% and 94 respectively. There are two dose schedule separated by different, slightly different um, couple of weeks. Um, and they're both mRNA. We don't know the duration of protection, although there are some studies coming out that we have three, six month data, and we're following it forward to see how long immunity will last. So this is it. We had in the vaccine trials, 45,000 people enrolled in Pfizer, 30,000 in Moderna. That is amazing. And we enrolled very quickly. I've enrolled for small trials and it took two years to complete enrollment. And that means you can't look at data until everyone's enrolled. Here, with massive efforts across the United States, we enrolled 45,000 people and 43,000 43, received the second dose, 25 received the second dose, 150 clinical sites for Pfizer, 89 for Moderna. Again, and then we had a decent diverse um, population. So we looked at diverse racial uh, and age-wise, as well as male and female, okay? So these studies were done appropriately, exhaustively, and they hit the um, you know, various uh, distribution for uh, ethnicity, sex, age, and also for comorbidities as well. Okay, so mRNA vaccines. So what are they? A couple key points. Um, mRNA technology is not new. It's, not un it's new, but it's not unknown. They've been studied for more than a decade. They are not a live virus. They don't carry the virus into the person. And the mRNA, people say, oh, that's, that sounds like DNA. 
that's, you're going to mess with my DNA. No, mRNA cannot enter the nucleus of the cell where your chromosomes lie, and it cannot interact. They're, they are genetically not compatible. Um, this is not a retrovirus. This is not able to. mRNA is very fragile and broken down. So what is mRNA? Okay, this is very wordy. I'll try to walk you through it. So mRNA is basically this material. This is an instruction manual, and it's coated with the lipid, and that gets into your cell, into your into your muscle. And that mRNA goes inside. And that's the instruction book on how to make a protein. In this case, we picked the spike protein, which is really important for that SARS-CoV-2 viral particle to get into your cell. It's the lock and key. So we're trying to attack to prevent that viral particle from getting into your cell. That's the spike protein. Um, so that's the only part, that's the only information that's being delivered to you. It can't replicate, it cannot create more viral particles. It is it, this little piece of material. Then your cell reads the material and creates the spike protein. That spoke, spike protein says, hey, I'm foreign. And now your body starts to create an immune response to it. Just like any other vaccine, the idea is to have a dedicated response to that one particle so that it will attack it the next time it sees it. So if that viral particle gets into your mouth, into your nose, your body's ready to go because your body doesn't have antibodies naturally to every single virus. Your body creates virus, creates antibodies as needed. That's something we're not born with all our antibodies. We create them and we create them when we see a foreign protein. So instead of getting infected with the virus, which you can generate your own antibodies, but you generate antibodies to various different parts of that, uh, that virus. There's hundreds of different types of proteins it could create. This is a, um, you know, a dedicated response towards the most um, important part of the virus. Okay, again, the effectiveness was stated: ninety-four percent seems to have effectiveness across age, sex, race, ethnicity, and among persons with underlying medical conditions. You can look at the, the trials to see who they tested it in, including some cardiovascular and other issues. Um, uh, sizes, obesity, and all of that, okay? More importantly, not only did it seem to be effective in preventing the illness and those who did only if it prevented um, severe illness as well. And I think that's more important to note here because we have the common cold. We, we fight off the common cold constantly. There are other coronaviruses out there that cause a respiratory illness that we fight off. So if we could get this down to a mild respiratory illness again, then we've won. Side effects, uh, we can talk a little bit more about this. I've been through it personally, I'm fully vaccinated. Uh, pain, swelling, and redness in the area at the site of the shot. And then you can have systemic uh, symptoms, tiredness, headache, muscle pain, chills, fever, and nausea. Oh no, you're, you're giving me the symptoms of the virus. Well, no, well, yes, but you're not, you don't actually have the virus throughout your body. That's your immune system. So when you get a viral infection, the headache and the fever are actually your body's immune response. So that's your immune system kicking in, uh, typically occurs within a couple of days of the shot, typically after the second shot, more likely. Although we do see some data, if you've had COVID that you'll get the, um, you might get some side effects after the first shot. And most of them are mild to moderate. Um, some of them, some people did require having to like take off from work for that. And we can talk more about that. This is not unusual. Okay, so um, for the last few minutes here, we'll talk about the viral vector. Okay, so those were the mRNA, it's encapsulated in a little lipid fatty particle in or gets injected into the muscle and it creates a uh, immune response. A viral vector vaccine takes a virus that's um, been inactivated um, and attenuated, so it's no longer going to cause illness but it still has the properties of a virus, which is really good entry into the human body and disseminate. And it's carrying a package and here it's carrying DNA, right? But this um, is to the spike protein again, but it cannot integrate, okay? So there's no integrating technology. That's actually very um, complicated and trying, we're trying to do that, I've done that in gene therapy. Right, we're trying to do integrated DNA using CRISPR and all of that catchy stuff. Um, we don't have that in, in this. You have the bare minimum inside that virus, it gets into the cell, and again, 
That DNA is your instruction booklet on how to make a protein. The protein's made. The body says, we don't like that protein. Let's make an antibody. And now you have your immune response. Okay, so that's basically what this is here. Um, and it's triggering our immune system to give off antibodies to that spike protein. Okay, so, hmm, uh-oh, J&J &J vaccine was only 66% effective. Uh-oh, that sounds terrible compared to 95. Well, it's not so terrible. Our, our flu vaccines only sometimes 40 to 60% effective um, in producing, preventing laboratory confirmed illness in patients who had no prior infection. However, it had a huge high efficacy at preventing severe disease. So no one died and no one had hospitalization from if they had the vaccine and got sick from the uh, COVID. So that, that is the, the critical aspect to this vaccine is that we have evidence that you will, you know, your likelihood of having severe disease is, is dramatically reduced and that's important. There's also evidence now, it's not that the other two don't work this way, but J&J &J specifically looked to see if it could prevent, uh, provide protection against asymptomatic infection. So a person is infected, but then does, um, that causes COVID-19, but does not get sick, can they pass it on? So they, it's not that the other two can't do that, it's just that they didn't look at it and they didn't study it yet, okay? Side effects are similar to the other two. Again, and this is a one shot, so one shot and up to four weeks out. So whereas with the mRNA vaccines, you're fully vaccinated two weeks after your second shot. Here we see the uh, most efficacy four weeks after your shot. Um, and uh, you do get some side effects when the, within those first few days after the shot, the similar profile, okay? Now, it's EUA, it's not, just like with any drug that we've tested, um, we follow and we hear about side effects and we're all encouraged to report them to our doctors and our doctors are reporting them. And then we have this vast amount of information that's accumulating in real time. Um, the studies are ongoing as well. So we're gonna learn more about long-term efficacy and long-term safety. But in the meantime, um, we are gathering some comfort that most of us who have been vaccinated um, are doing well and we haven't gotten sick. Okay, so what's our summary? COVID-19, I think I've shown you, has both short-term and long-term effects, um, sometimes quite severe. There are three vaccines that have received EUA status in the US, two are mRNA, and one is viral vector-based. All three are highly efficacious in preventing the infection, um, including prevention of severe disease. Side effects do occur, and they're mild to moderate in most cases. Um, Short-term safety data is very reassuring. Long-term studies are underway. And studies in children are currently being conducted. Um, they've, they've completed the age 12 to 16 in some of the mRNA vaccines. They're looking and enrolling for child children. And we should have some more data soon on that as well. And children, um, younger uh, adolescents are getting vaccinated now as well. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there for questions. I tried to give a general overview. I think, Don, you're going to help me feel some of the questions. You bet. We've got a good stack, so I'm going to try to organize them a little bit. Okay, I'm going to, should I stop sharing my screen or? Yeah, that's fine. That way you'll be nice and big when you're in. Either way, or I can. Yeah, that's good too. Yeah, I have a nice um, how to prevent COVID yeah. slide. That's a great one. Um, so the first question was, how different are COVID signs and symptoms in patients with Fabry disease? And do you see uh, more pa Fabry patients with more severe symptoms? Yeah, so I think I'm going to stop sharing because it is a little, um, hold on. So, so I don't have this large a cohort, but there are being, there are publications and I feel like there have been some publications. So, um, at the end of the day, we have to look at our comorbidity. So if you have mild symptoms of your febre, so this is the same thing with all the lysosomal. I have um, a series of uh, dozens of patients with lysosomal or enzyme disorders. And generally, um, they reflected what we know about COVID. Age, increased risk of complications, comorbidities. So enzyme alone, I can't say that your specific enzyme deficiency is leading to a higher risk. It's your underlying disease burden. So if you have 
cardiomyopathy, if you are status post cardiac transplant, if you are status post renal transplant and on immunosuppressive therapy, you're in a higher risk category by definition. So you don't necessarily have to say it's Febre, it's the rest of it. What if, so my patients who were young with um, car, uh, attenuated or late onset variants, or even my classical female who had started therapy in her teens and was able to successfully get her acroparesthesias under control and her GI symptoms never developed significant uh, renal disease. Her, her course was just reflective of her uh, others in her age group, which was in the thirties, you know, a bad flu for two weeks. Another patient in her forties had um, cardiac variant, but very mild cardiac. She was laid up for four to six weeks. So one, I can't predict, we can't ever predict because I had a seven year old with um, a different uh, disease state, and she did she did much better than some others. So it really look at your disease burden, look at um, the uh, to to understand your risk. Look at the age and your co your other co comorbidities. Okay. So I can just briefly add to that. You that can, yeah, part of a publication that uh, we looked at cases of Fabra disease across the world, um, around the world. <laughs> And really the differences we found had as exactly Dr. Lau just said very eloquently, it has to do with what else is going on. So Fabry disease doesn't seem to be an independent risk factor. It's whether or not you've got kidney disease, if it's whether or not you've already got heart disease, if you've already had strokes. So that's the best way to look at it is what else is going on with you. Um, there's a couple more questions that are general and then they're all vaccine. So I'm gonna hop to the last. Yeah, there's one, one question about steroids or is that for disease state or for vaccine, I forget. Um, there's one that was, uh, there's two now that are on steroids and immune oh, suppression. So we can me, go there. Yeah, I see that one just because it's related yeah. to, so interesting. So I have a whole slide deck on treating COVID-19. Um, in the initial phases of an infection, you don't want to suppress your immune system because you want to fight it off. So in theory, you don't want to just automatically start a steroid, right? But there is a role for steroids in our patients with severe COVID and it has helped, right? There's that secondary cytokine storm and your immune system kind of goes awry and we have, and you have, you will see steroids being used. So there was a question, I'm taking prednisone, can you transplant mild symptoms when I got it? Do you think this helped me? I don't know because whatever happened in that first phase, you fought off that virus because sometimes we're worried if you're immunosuppressed, you're not going to fight off the virus, right? So you could be more vulnerable initially, but then that second phase, um, it's, so you see that patients are not being given steroids immediately. There is, they're waiting for inflammatory factors to go off. So I don't wanna say universally, yeah, prednisone is a, a good treatment. There is a role for the steroids in, the, in that inflammatory phase of the disease. Other, um, it, it's really hit and miss. I have a lot of anecdotal study of, of patients reporting but doc, I'm on, on this medication. I'm on monoclonal antibody. I have this autoimmune disease and I did okay. I'm like, that's great. Because guess what? 98% of patients are doing okay, but you don't know if you're gonna fall in that category and have a, a, a worse course. So that's really hard to, to say one way or the other. Um, Hydroxychloroquine didn't really pan out uh, as prevention, but what's panning out right now, just so you guys know, and you should know this, uh, and I have a slide on it is if you have, tested for COVID-19 and your high risk factors, and there's not even, even just one comorbidity. So it could be age, uh, obesity, it could be anything. Uh, monoclonal antibodies have been developed or have EOA status now. And there's two of them um, that they're used in combo. And if you do it in mild disease, now this has to be mild disease, you're not hospitalized, you're not requiring oxygen, administered within the first 10 days of your test of a positive result, it has reduced hospitalization by 70%. And so in New York and Dawn, I don't know about other areas, we have this huge referral network where you call up the urgent care and say, I'm positive, I have mild disease and this, do I meet criteria? And they, it's a one-time infusion of two monoclonal antibodies. And that's what we're doing right now, just so you guys know. Yeah, okay. that's wonderful. Um, next question. Uh, from a quality of life perspective, if you're a long hauler who's lost your sense of smell, is there any way to help regain it? So we're talking about neurons regenerating. So uh, of all the neurons to regenerate, your sense of smell is probably pretty good with your taste. 
most of your taste is your smell actually. So that's why we put it together. So your olfactory bulb to a degree can regenerate um, these neurons, can um, these receptors can regenerate, receptors can regenerate. Um, so all hope is not lost if it's been three months. Um, you can still wait it out. So it's not like it's now you're at three months, you're never going to get it back. It can still, you can still give it a longer time. But after that, there's not much we can do to enhance, right? There's nothing um, we can do to target any kind of neuronal regrowth. That's our problem here. We don't know how to do that yet. So um, I'd say talk with your neurologist if it's still like three to six months out and see. Um, I have case reports. Again, my colleagues are going to be reporting on long-term neurologic outcomes. Um, some people do see some, some kind of um, return after several months. So think about neurons, just like with your nerves, nerve endings, it takes um, many months to regrow some of the, the myelin sheath around uh, for neuropathy. So. Um, here's a question. If your immune system is suppressed because of transplant or anti-rejection meds, how do you know how much protection you have after being vaccinated? Is there a reliable way to test? That's a hard question. So I'm not, I'm going to, I am going to pause and say, I'm not the vaccine immunology expert. I'm just another physician that's doing this, but you're, um, so in general, you're right. If you're immunosuppressed for whatever reason, for whatever reason you're immunosuppressed, you may not mount an adequate response, right? So you have to talk to your doctor, especially if you're on certain regimens, timing of it, um, kidney transplant, it's very, um, uh, you know, you don't wanna risk graft versus host and you don't come off of that. There are ways to talk to your doctor. You can get checked for this spike protein. Now, technically they don't have standards to say, okay, if you have this level of antibodies to the spike protein, so at least that's better than what we had several months ago, which was just a general antibody response, right? IgM and IgG to COVID-19. Now you can go in and you can get your COVID-19 spike protein checked. But does that value, you know, we don't know absolutely if that confers, um, but we are actively investigating that. And that's why I'm hedging here because I know in a few months they're gonna come out. That's how they're saying, lasting immunity. So, um, and you don't want to check too soon after you get the vaccine either, because you need to build those antibodies up. So four to six weeks out, you could try to check to see. I would talk to your kidney transplant because they're dealing with, it's not just Febrate, it's every single person who's been through a transplant. It, that would be a good forum to talk. I'm sure they've sorted it out about um, how they're uh, stratifying everyone's uh, risk. Thanks. Um, here's a question. I received the Moderna vaccine seven days after receiving other vaccines that were needed for another surgery. Now I see data saying you shouldn't get the COVID vaccine within 14 days of getting a different vaccine. Will my vaccine be as effective or do I need another set? Yeah, I think it's it's for good practice right now. It's kind of like when I say um, don't mix two things at once because you don't know the reaction is to one or the other. I don't think your effectiveness is reduced. We haven't studied it, right? So so we have the measles, mumps, rubella because we figured it out and we put it all together and we, and we jabbed the little baby once instead of like, you know, several times because your immune system can, can effectively create antibodies to each of those, right? Um, the, but the, the bigger problem is, oh, you get a reaction and you're not sure. And it's a severe one. Like you can always get an anaphylactoid reaction, right? You can get throat cold, you know, like your um, breathing difficulty, blood pressure drops to any medication. Now imagine you're taking both within a certain window and you're like, which one is it? And you're now you're stuck, right? So I don't think you have to worry about effectiveness, still go on the same schedule, but try to space it out so that there's no overlap. So I also do injections, right? Your, your infusions, right? I don't like you to get your vaccine the same day you're getting your Fabrazyme because now you've probably been on your Fabrazyme a long time and you don't have reactions, but now you have a fever. Like, is the fever from the vaccine? Is it because you have COVID? Is it because of, you know, so try to space it out from your infusion as well. Any injectable, right? You, you don't want to inject at the same time period. So I try to say, get your um, vaccine and wait seven. Now you don't necessarily want to miss a whole infusion, but you could wait seven to 10 days, okay? This is a question you've kind of handled, um, but some sources say that mRNA vaccines are not gene therapy, and some say the vaccines are gene therapy, and it's scaring people. Mm -hmm. How do you you explained it nicely. Is there another way you would say to people who are like, oh, it's yeah, it's 
it's hard because it's getting nitpicky at what is a mRNA particle. Okay, so let's go back to basic. Um, well, it's not basic biology or basic DNA and RNA are very similar um, molecules in the sense of uh, their um, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. So they are these little chemicals that are very similar, but they differ in very important ways as well. So one's more um, DNA is more um, resilient and it's packaged into chromosomes and they're permanently in your cells. mRNA are these messengers that are very unstable in a cell for a good reason. So when you want to make more protein because you're growing, you're gonna make more of this protein versus that protein. So your mRNA is gonna be expressed. Your DNA turns into mRNA, mRNA becomes protein. So it's kind of like you have your, your instruction manual in your DNA and you're, you have like a little co a copy of that when you want it, that's your mRNA to make a protein, to make the car. So your instruction book on how to make the car and in between that big book is this little mRNA. So a gene technically by definition is DNA, that's all. So it's not gene therapy, but it is this very interesting concept of instead of patching a big protein, right? Taking this big globular protein and trying to fit it inside something and then injecting it in here, you take this little piece of mRNA and inject it and then make your, make your body make that protein. So it's kind of semantics. Is it, it's really neat though. It's really uh, like we, we've, you know, instead of giving you packaging the protein, you know what it's like to get protein because you're getting a protein, right? Your IV fabrizyme is a big fat protein you're injecting into your vein. We can't fit it in your muscle because it would hurt. It's too big, right? So we give it in your vein. And so you are getting a protein injected in you every two weeks. And guess what happens? Why do you have to get, keep getting it over and over again? Because it breaks down. It doesn't last. That darn protein is not lasting you and you have to get it again and again. Your body has to keep making the enzyme. So think about it this way, that mRNA is even more fragile. And so mRNA is being used or RNA is being used as therapy, absolutely in other diseases, right? We're doing um, antisense oligonucleotides for SMA. You heard these like these creep, these poor little babies need to get injected every four months. Why? Because the mRNA doesn't last. The RNA does not last. It doesn't. So think about it. Technically, think about it differently. Think it's, it's, it's a newer technology um, and it's uh, very directed towards a specific uh, function. Okay. Thanks. Um, there's a question. I heard J&J &J is more standard than mRNA vaccine. Should February patients be vaccinated with that instead? I'm not sure it's more standard. It's a, I could, I could, make it sound scarier to you, right? It's it, right, because we use viral vectors to carry things before and we use it, um, the DNA, um, but that could scare you, right? You're getting injected with a virus that's gonna infect you. And then it's, um, it's really just being comfortable with the various scientific approaches. It's the same thing I, I talk about with our patients when we're thinking about clinical studies for February. Like, do I want a small molecule like SRT or would I go for gene therapy? What kind of gene therapy? This one, I'm just gonna squish two questions together, but someone asked, should Fabry patients be vaccinated? And then should, after being vaccinated, should they act any differently than the general population as the country reopens? Right. So blanket statements are always, um, for a doctor, are very scary. We have to be like lots of caveats there, you know, everyone should talk to their doctor about their individual risk factors. But in general, we're saying that unless there's a specific reason like an allergy or something very specific that you want to talk to your doctor about, most people should be vaccinated, okay, including our patients with February disease. Um, that, you know, you could talk to your doctor about why you are worried or concerned that you should be one of the exemptions from it, but there's so much benefit. You are, I look at it as I've been frightened for this whole year for my patients to get COVID. I'm, you know, white knuckling it about when I get the phone call and hoping that it's a mild course or not, because I've seen both sides of it. And our patients are generally sicker, right? Our patients with February disease 
um, who are later to diagnosis. So when we look at the risk benefit ratio here, and that's what we have to think about. I know we're actively injecting something into ourselves, um, but the risk of a bad outcome is so small, minuscule at this point, as we have thousands and millions of people uh, vaccinated and the risk of a vaccine, um, serious vaccine side effect is so small, but you're at higher risk, like magnitudes of order higher of having a severe outcome from COVID. And that's how I look at it. It's really, you know, that's, um, that's how to look at it. So then, okay, now you're vaccinated. Well, nothing's a hundred percent. So you're likely not to get, get it. If you do get it, the severity is likely to be a lot less, but who knows? Is everyone getting their spike protein check? No, I don't know. No, so we don't have enough people around us vaccinated to really say, you should just take off your mask and walk through the middle of you know Grand Central Terminal. No, right? Because you're taking a bet. It's all about risk. Again, it goes back to risk benefit. A mask, if it's not too intrusive to just wear the mask around people. I'm fully vaccinated. I feel like I can sleep better at night but I'm still masking and washing around my patients and colleagues. But as we get more people vaccinated and we realize that there's something called herd immunity, the likelihood that that transmission is gonna occur drops dramatically, just like with the masks, right? Beforehand, we're like, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. If you wear a mask and I wear a mask, it drops down. The same thing with vaccination, the likelihood goes down. You're 95% protected, I'm protected. So I would say, you know, make it case by case with your family members. Um, I'll, I'll share a personal thing. Like a lot of my family members are now vaccinated. I hadn't seen them for a year. I'm seeing them, you know, we're still a little distanced. We're, we're being careful and cautious. So think about it that way. It's not all or none. It's not zero or a hundred percent. Okay. I have a question from Lisa. Are these vaccines effective against COVID variants? So uh, yeah. We're trying to figure that out in real time because these variants are, I had some slides up and I took them out. So certain variants, yeah, they're showing some effectiveness against it. Uh, the UK variants, um, the South African, the African one I think was reduced, but we're in real time. So don't quote me on it right now. So it's really in, it's ever evolving. Um, and they're and you know they're testing it. They're already started to test new vaccines, right? Uh, to, uh, to the variants as well. So this might come to be a situation like the flu vaccine. You know how it's, it's annoying. We have to get it every year. It's because it's slightly different. Um, that's what we foresee is that we potentially need a booster that's like, okay, we need a little bit different. But so far, a lot of the, you know, some of the variants look like they're going to be effective against it. It's not, we don't know exactly. So it's still worthwhile to get it. And then uh, back to COVID in general, does COVID increase organ damage? My brother had COVID and his kidney function declined drastically and now he's in kidney failure. Yeah, so again, I, I, I talk a lot about the uh, non-February experience because fortunately a lot of my February patients sheltered in place. Like they, you know, just like my MPS, my other rare diseases, I don't have a lot of cases because they just stayed away. So looking to the general population, what was, I said it in my presentation, the kidney damage that resulted was just, I, I don't think it was common knowledge to the average person, but if you talk to any ICU doctor, and I went through it personally with, with family members, um, normal kidney function at the beginning and they ended up needing dialysis. And why is this? And I can tell you a little bit why if you're interested, it's this whole concept of the coagulation profile, the, the blood got thicker, there was a lot of hypercoagulability. So the same thing that you throw a clot to stroke, they saw microemboli in the kidneys on autopsy. Um, so we're seeing the kidneys getting hit. Um, don't quote me on all aspects of the mechanisms of kidney damage, but that was definitely one part was some microemboli hitting the kidney and knocking it out. So we had patients that required and they, and they developed it. They had no other pre um, existing kidney disease. So absolutely end organ damage was happening, heart, brain, lung, kidneys, and even look at the skin and the fingers, right? The, the little microemboli causing those little um, the COVID toes and fingers. Um, so, so it absolutely caused end organ damage and persistent in a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I saw something today that Moderna is effective for six months. This will have to be boosted, question. <laughs> yeah, so why you're seeing, why they're just saying six months is because um, it probably just released the data. So that's good news. So they can't, they, um, this is the long-term study. So all of these uh, pay, uh, people that volunteered, if they stayed in the study, they're gonna be tracked over time. And, um, and so we have six months of data. It doesn't mean it's only six months, but right now they're trying to see how long. So when they first came out, they're like, we don't know, maybe it's three months, right? There's a whole thing about if I had COVID or if I have my vaccine, I'm good for three months. Now, okay, I'm good for six months. And then hopefully in nine months, we'll hear nine month data. 12 month data and and hopefully we'll figure out if we'll need a booster or not and when so it's it's this is this is this is a study happening before your eyes right this is this is it's a scary but it's also very interesting to see that this is how this is how we figure it out right that's how we figured out fabrizyme there were these individuals that were so brave to 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 risk and and get their first enzyme infusion then they sat there and they donated their blood through like 24 hours to see how long did that, that, that protein last. We still do it today, right? With the Protalix enzyme to figure it out. Um, the SRTs with KAs and all of those, they all do this. This is what you guys do for us. You volunteer and we measure, and then we measure over the long-term and, and over the long-term efficacy. So Febre in the, in the registry, we see how, how does this work? How does, is it working still? Is it, is it not working still? Uh -oh. Hold on, I'm gonna pause one second, but could keep. All right, any other questions that wanna come in? Uh, oh, there we go. As soon as, um, we're gonna have a couple more questions, John. Okay, we've got one more. Okay, sorry. No problem. I think we've got one more question, then we'll round it up. Uh, to give, let you back to your evening. Um, back to the question regarding COVID and organ damage. Was this prevalent in mild case of COVID or just more severe case of COVID? Oh, good question. So I kind of glossed over it pretty quickly because I didn't do a comprehensive. I've done this before with the short term. Um, so the short term ones in general, right? If you've recovered from it, you had a mild course, you're going to be fine. Um, if you had severe COVID, uh, there's a higher prevalence of that you would have an organ damage and that was irreversible. But there's this subset and these are um, case series, I don't have a good number overall, that you could have mild COVID and have long hauler syndrome. And in that long hauler syndrome, some people had persistent inflammation of their heart or they had um, persistent um, shortness of breath or persistent neurologic. And so we're still trying to figure out the actual percent of that. We're hearing a lot of those cases over time. So in general, if you've recovered from COVID, you had a mild course, you're not gonna have persistent end organ damage. However, if you feel symptoms, even though you've recovered from a mild case and you didn't need hospitalization, you stayed at home, you felt crappy for like two weeks or something and you started to feel better, but now you have an elevated heart rate, get it checked out is the point. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to hedge there about percents. Um, so out of, again, listen to your body. If you had a mild case and it completely resolved, you're in the clear. But they are, like if you're younger and you're an athlete, some of the colleges are requiring like a, a cardiac clearance now. Um, and I think we'll get better time as, as consortiums come together and report on these. This is again, real time. Um, that's what we're seeing here. So we have like headaches. Um, we're collecting headache syndromes for post COVID, again, it's not life threatening, but it, it's a lot of morbidity in it. Um, so we have to see, and not everybody who has a mild case reports that, hey, I had a mild case and I'm all good. So we might be having inflated numbers because we don't hear about all the cases that were recovered, okay? Wonderful, thank you so much. This was so informative and so great. And thank you for spending so much time answering the questions as they all came in. Um, yeah. Anything else you wanna add in? No, I just, you know, again, um, I try to fact check everything in real time. Things are only as up to date as we have and um, things can change. And we're learning about this every day. And um, as I learn it and understand it, I'll share with you. And, and what's really important is like what Dawn's paper is coming out is just getting an international response and, and these rare diseases and understanding and making sure that everyone's reporting on what they're seeing. 
and that's important. Okay. Right, I have a couple more things quickly. So, Dr. Lo, if you could send me the cover slide for your presentation that I can put on the recording uh, so we can publish that. And then I'd also, um, if you could make a note to, can you connect me with your pulmonologist at NYU? Uh, oh, sure. But we're going to try to get a, another presentation done. And if you could do that, that would be helpful. And the last thing um, is most of you probably already know in our daily Fabry Disease Awareness Month posts that we're doing this month, I put out a summary of uh, off of the social media, the international so social media page. There's been a lot of discussions. And so I posted 70 uh, comments from 71 people about their vaccination. So if you want to get an idea of what people are saying about their vaccination, 17 people did had no uh, side effects or reactions. And then a lot of people had uh, the, the usual common uh, side effects. Not hardly anyone had, I don't know if anyone had very severe, but a lot of, of the normal things, you know, sight pain and swelling and redness and, and all of the things you mentioned in a mild form for most of them. But if you didn't see those already, it's both on the, our Facebook page, the NFTF's Facebook page, and in the newsletter. So you can take a look at those. And then the last thing I have is, uh, Dr. Law, thank you so much for uh, doing this for us. It's been great. And uh, Dawn is going to do the, um, and thank you to Dawn for her great job uh, moderating as well. And Dawn's going to do the last event of the evening. And this is reserved for the people with Fabry disease, family members, and caregivers uh, to answer the, the question in the chat session to get the, uh, to win the prize drawing. So do I? Yeah, so if you meet the uh, requirement of being the primary person, uh, as Jerry mentioned, put COVID in the messengers in order to, and to be entered for a drawing for a gift card. So just put COVID in the chat and uh, our very able Brenda will take a second to give me uh, the winner. As you're doing nice. that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, Jerry, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I had my vaccine and I'm a, a, you know, I'm a bit of a baby sometimes about things, but um, my vaccine first one, I had a sore arm when I raised it for a good 48 hours, um, but I arranged it, it was good. And then the second one, I actually, I had a low grade fever I felt tired. I wanted to sleep, and I took uh, I took a, a day to just kind of uh, re recover from it. And then I felt good as new after that. So, but I was prepared for it, and I want you guys to be prepared for it too. And actually, the older you are, you may not get as many reactions. Um, it depends. So you know, it's it, it. There are reactions, but they're mild, and they're and they you can recover from them pretty quickly. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So. I was apprehensive, also, or I don't know about also, but I was apprehensive. And I'm a guy with um, stage three chronic kidney disease and about 50% lung capacity and heart transplant, along with lots of other things. So I had a little bit of apprehension. And I was one of the lucky ones that got both shots and had no side effects. So that was good. That was a, a welcome uh, thing for me. So. What's going to happen now is Brenda is going to take all your, all the people that uh, responded to the, for the prize drawing, assign you a number, put it into a random number generator, and she's going to tell us who the winner is. Uh, Brenda, how's that going? I have almost got everybody in here. All right, thank you. Jerry, Steve just asked what state you're from. Who? Uh, Steve Matheny, Matheny. Want to know what state you're from? Me? What state I'm from? Yep. I'm in North Carolina. All right. The organization, the National Fabric Disease Foundation, has an address of Washington, D.C., because I was living in that area when I started the organization. Well, in uh, 2007, we moved to, to North Carolina, and we are still there. Hillsboro, North Carolina. Good so Brenda has told us, told me her, our winner, 
is Stefan Tosen. So he started our chat and he's ending our chat. <laughs> Congratulations. Stefan, you are one lucky guy. <laughs> you, you won two of the drawings, if I recall, at, at the annual conference. Is that right? See? And I think uh, Stefan is from, you're muted, so we can't hear you, but um, I think Stefan is from uh, Germany. Is that right? Yep, he is. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good job. All right. Thanks, everybody. Stefan, he seems to be doing well with the drawings. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lau and Dawn and Brenda, and thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll say good night. <laughs>